like to thank the organizers of the conference um, and for those who put on the Somatic Confusion Calling Challenge um, for inviting me to come speak today and to discuss our work on Retect and its application to the Dream Challenge Synthetic Data. Also, this work that we did was very much a team collaboration, so I speak here on behalf of the rest of my team at the Broad as well. So in order to generate accurate semantic mutation calling data, we had a full workflow from starting from the downloading of the data, QC, and calling the mutations, and then filtering. So I'm going to start and walk through the data processing workflow, and then generate the data um, from Synapse, and then a brief overview of our calling method without additional filters, and then how we looked at the four synthetic challenges, and finally discussing some of the challenges that we saw and importance of using the synthetic data as a benchmark tool um, for semantic point mutations. And so the, the Broad Institute has a widespread pipeline for um, processing sequencing data from the fat, raw FASTQ files through to a finally processed BAM file ready for analysis. So we utilize this, this workflow for the dream challenge as well. So when we initially downloaded the data from Synapse, we chose to realign the data with VWA MEM, which is a recent aligner developed by Hung Lee. Um, it's the second version as opposed to the VWA, which is the previous one. And we chose to do so because we found that it recovers many previously unmapped reads, specifically reads with long um, deletions in them, shown here in the Innovative Genomics Viewer IGV screenshot. So what you'll see in the image is the BAM file at the top of the screen was aligned with standard VWA, and the one on the lower half of the screen is aligned with VWA MEM. And you'll see there are about six reads that we are able to recover with this new alignment method, um, therefore giving us more sensitive in in-depth calls. Therefore, we chose to align all the data we had with this, even though we were calling point mutations here. Um, other important parts of this upstream method prior to mutation calling um, was marking up duplicate reads in the BAM file. So we were removed reads where both reads um, aligned to the same location. This is especially important in somatic mutation calling um, at low uh, allele fractions because if you have two reads that actually are the same but both support a variant, you might falsely call the event a true positive. Also, we perform base quality recal recalibration, which estimated the base quality based on multiple covariates once the data were aligned. And finally, a joint local realignment between the tumor and the normal BAM file um, to, to ensure the same decision was made of how to map the, all reads at the same locus and then reads between the tumor and the normal. And you can imagine how this would be an issue if you're doing somatic mutation calling because if a different decision was made on how to align a read in the tumor versus the normal, then you won't be able to filter it out as seen in normal sample. So once we had these BAM files, we also formed an additional data QC metric um, using our algorithm contest we previously published. And what this aimed at is often in the lab, it's the lab can be a messy place to work. It, um, there is contamination in data that thing is 100% pure. Uh, for example, in 260 TGA samples, 22 at least had greater than 1.5% contamination. And the contamination I'm talking about here is when you have um, blood from a different sample, a different individual, um, in some very low frequency contaminate your current sample. And the phenotype of this will be very low allele fraction events in your tumor that happen at DB step sites. So very um, current at high frequency in the population. Um, so we applied this method and then we could um, feed forward the result that we got from this contest number into our mutation color. So this into the approach of mutate itself. So mutate looks at the tumor and the normal sample in, in jointly and runs two tests and calculates the log likelihood um, under two different models. One model being that any alternate reads seen in the tumor are just noise and that there's actually no true event there. Um, and the other is a variant model where they're actually the alternate leads in the tumor do represent true variation um, in that sample. And if you get the log likelihood ratio of this, you can then set a threshold for what to filter as a true positive or a false positive event. And we actually use this number as one of our knobs to turn in the synthetic data, whether to, how to play with our sensitivity and specificity. 
Once the statistic is calculated, um, we then apply a number of filters, which we expand upon in the synthetic data, um, including some which are a proximal gap, where if a mutation occurred within 11 base pairs of a, of a deletion, then we would assume this would be an alignment error. Um, further, we removed events that had poor mapping regions, or a cluster deposition position where the mutation occurred close to the ends of all, all mutations occurred close to the ends of the reads. Um, additionally, um, after these fills were applied, we applied a panel of normals. The stop mutation color for mutant um, is to apply uh, a normal of 300, um, 1,000 genome normals. So we see a variant in any of those 1,000 genomes. We claim it to be either artifactual or a germline event and then removed it from our analysis. Um, and after this process, then we have the candidate semantic mutation calls. Um, so the original evaluation of performance from the new type paper by Christian Sobaltius uh, about two years ago now um, is shown here. And you'll see um, in panel A that with a log cutoff of 6.3, we were able to have a low false positive rate while still maintaining high sensitivity. And then you can break this down by a little fraction in depth as well, looking over at figure B. Um, and you can see that even at um, low allele fraction, so like 10% allele fraction, if you have, if you do have like 60x coverage in the tumor, you do have around 95% sensitivity. And currently also a lot of tumors like the TCGA and other projects, the tumor is now at around 100x coverage. Um, so our sensitivity only is improved from what this graph is showing. So that takes me to the application of Mutech to the Dream Challenge synthetic data. Uh, and I do also want to point out that the, there are many great algorithms out there and that were submitted to the board. They had to extend um, the number of decimal places for evaluation of colors um, out to the thousandth decimal place because all the colors were identical if you had it to the tens of the hundreds. Um, so I do just want to point that out. Um, we did rank among the challenges um, first and third of them and then second in the third synthetic challenge. Um, having around a balanced accuracy of around 95%. Also, since Mutech is available for public download, there are many other teams who actually did try using our caller as well. And for example, in Challenge 4, three out of the top four teams use Mutech in their calling pipeline. So there are many other users out there besides us at the firm. So we got the mutation calls for each individual challenges. The way we began to look at the data was to split it out by tumor allele fraction um, as a percent of the total number um, that we called. Um, and you'll see here the distribution of calls. And what immediately jumped to our attention, especially in this set, um, was that there was a peak down at very low allele fraction, which seemed to not fit into the general trend of the data. This is specifically highlighted when you, when you do synthetic data at high allele fractions. But you can also plot similar things with cancer cell fractions um, and use some biological knowledge of what you'd expect the distribution to look like. So we took a closer look um, at those events at very low allele fractions. And it turns out that they have very low LOD scores as well. So they're right on the, the cutoff of 6.3 LOD score, uh, which is what our balance was between sensitivity and specificity. And that's shown in the graph below. So then we could take out some of those sites and look at them in IGV um, to see if they looked real, if we could believe them by eye. And for example, here I've shown what we believe to be a false positive um, event because it's a very low quality base. You might be able to see it project well, but there are many seeds um, that are slightly lighter in color, suggesting a low quality base. And you also do see some in the normal as well. Therefore, based on, upon these observations, we increased the log score to 10 from a previous at 6.3, and that increased our balance accuracy from 0.96 to 0.975, um, winning that challenge. Now the challenges continue to get progressively harder after the first one. Um, here again is showing a little fraction on the x-axis and then count as a histogram on the y-axis. And you'll see that there are, there are multiple um, distributions in there. It's not just this 50% distribution. Again, though, you can see this uh, strange distribution down at very low allele fractions that we hypothesized might be um, artifactual um, noise. Um, so we, in order to increase our um, specificity, we chose to max as our depth that greater than or equal to 8x, so not to confuse if it was lower than that. 
because that was also the end of exon regions and not as confident locations. <coughs> also, in this data, we chose to restrict our allele fraction to less than, uh, less than 0.65. Uh, which you would do a similar thing in real cancer data if you had a very low purity tumor, uh, especially if it was a diploid sample, you could do a similar restriction to, to remove noise at um, high low uh, We also reduced our loss score deck down, down to seven from 10 before because we're now we're calling a lot of low low-fraction regions. Finally, we also um, changed one of our filters, um, which is a power to detect strand artifact. So I didn't go into this filter as much earlier, um, but we have one of our filters is to test, to, is to make sure that all reads that support the alternate allele are equally balanced between forward and reverse direction of the reads supporting the mutation. And in order to normally do this, we have 90% have confidence uh, or power uh, in order to see that. We reduce that power down to 80%, allowing this filter to be uh, more stringent um, in the data. And you can see that if we if we lowered it from 0.9 to 0.8, many of the underpowered events were in these low allele fraction and seemed to cover what we hypothesized originally to be a false positive curve in the distribution of allele fractions. Additionally, we applied another panel of normals besides just what Mutex stock was applying. Um, so 258 um, whole genome samples for a panel. This brought our balance accuracy up to around 95%. Finally, looking at challenge synthetic challenge four, which is the most recent synthetic challenge. Um, as you, you, you can see in these plots, that the allele fraction distribution keeps getting lower, so they keep getting much more challenging to call. Um, and also, specifically, this one is more um, very similar to what true data we see across uh, TTCGA and other projects. Uh, so because of this, because of low low fraction, we lowered our, our log score back down to 6.3, which is what the standard color uses. We also removed events that are present in DBSNP and then also in high frequencies in the population. Specifically for this data, and the members of our group were working on a larger panel of normals that we adopted when filtering out synthetic challenge four. So now not only do we have around 350 whole genome samples that went into our panel normals, but we also had around 8,000 whole exomes um, that, so in the whole exome normals. So if we saw the mutation in some fraction of those 8,000, we removed it from our data set as well. Additionally, um, there are, are some events that we claimed, that we thought by looking through an IGB that were alignment errors. And we hypothesized that if we align them single-ended rather than pair-ended, um, so instead of having the pair map down and mapping down its associated pair with it, um, just to make sure that they have high confidence mapping of single reads to map it independently, <coughs> we could remove some of those false positives. And that is indeed what we saw. So here's an example of a site that if we align those reads single-ended rather than pair-ended, um, we are able to remove. So you can see supporting mutation um, of uh, this T to C mutation looks the same read as an insertion. It looks like an insertion motif, so this read is just shifted um, in, in its alignment. And you also see support of that same um, in the normal sample as well. So we were able to remove alignment artifacts like this um, by applying that filter. By doing these, we were able to get a balanced accuracy in this data set of around 86%. So the, the other ways to look at data to try and identify false positives, which, do, which we do regularly in the synthetic data and the other data sets as well, um, besides the fraction, and that's looking at mutational patterns. There are a number of recently published papers, including one from Mike Lawrence and Gaddy Getz, um, which I am in, that look at mutation signatures across various cancer types. So you see in these uh, what we call Lego plots on the left-hand side of the screen, the each different tumor type has a unique signature. So cervical cancer, for example, has an alphabet signature, which you see the back row of the level flag. Um, and these are counts of mutations sorry, on the y-axis. Lung adenocarcinoma has what we call a smoking signature, where there are many C to A mutations. So having an understanding of what you would expect in your tumor type, in terms of what type of mutation pattern to see, would give you some idea of whether you're seeing false positives or whether you're seeing um, real mutations. 
we utilized this method previously and developed what we call the OxidG artifact, where there's many oxidative DNA damage during cell preparation. And you'll see that the signature of this was mainly dominated by the C to A uh, in a specific context, and that dominated over the rest of all possible signatures. So either this could be exciting scientific discovery, or it's an artifact in our data. I may be cynical, but I usually go with the latter. Um, and so then by looking at this, you can then dig into those mutations and filter them out appropriately. We did do this um, for the synthetic challenge data. And what you'll see, it's a very relatively flat signature. Um, equal for all mutations that we saw, it was in equal contexts. Um, so it was independent of anything. There was no dominant signature <laughs> suggesting to us that there was no real um, smoking gun for a false positive artifact. I want to touch on briefly also that there's many challenges of making synthetic data. Um, the, it's hard to reproduce um, actual true true data to all its complexities. Um, the Gene Challenge team has done an excellent job of, of creating such a tool um, that's continually in development. Um, so for example, um, one thing that we found through doing the challenges is that there's, there's a tag in BAM files called Original Base Quality Score Before Alignment. Um, that you can get, that wasn't included in some of the synthetic data, so therefore didn't represent exactly what true events was. So you can see here in the plot distribution of this OQ tag between false positives and true positives, and you see all the all the true positives are missing this tag. Uh, furthermore, other important thing to take into consideration in synthetic data um, is to put in the point mutations um, in both reads if they're overlapping at the mutation site. Um, as this is what you see, what, is this is what, what you see um, in data you generate off the sequencing. That means that it's very critical for evaluation and benchmarking of mutation calling methods um, to have synthetic data and to continue to benchmark the data and compare across algorithms. Um, and the ICC TCA Dream Mutation Calling Challenge has provided an extremely excellent open source tool to generate such synthetic data. Um, and I think method of calling has been improved dramatically over the course of the challenges and into the future by community use and its feedback as well. So I thank them for that effort. So I just want to thank the Dream Challenge team for putting on the challenge and working through um, and creating an, an excellent tool for benchmarking um, that we continue to use as we develop our tools even, not, even though we've already submitted everything to the challenge. I also want to thank the members of the Bro Dream Challenge team, um, Adam Kaiser, Christian Smolskis, and Lewis Burleson, um, who's here as well in the audience and has a poster. 